Good evening, everybody, or whatever time it may be where you are. I'm noticing that we do have people here from all over the world. My name's Nicole Naditz. I'll be your host for this evening and for this program. And I'm really glad you've chosen to take this time to spend with us as we talk about the high leverage teaching practices and how those intersect with high quality project-based language learning. This is the first of two webinars that we will be doing on this topic. Um, the two webinars are different. And so we hope if you have time, you'll join us again next week, actually at the same time and on this same Zoom channel. And I will introduce our guests in just a moment. But before I do, I'd like to give a huge thank you to the NFLRC at the University of Hawaii um, for really spearheading this project and putting this all together and making this possible for us this evening. Our overarching question really is the same for both webinars, and that is, to help us better understand what concepts for, um, that we can pull out of the high leverage teaching practices, which concepts from there will help me better implement high quality project-based language learning for my learners. And so to do that, we're first gonna talk very briefly about what we mean by high quality project-based language learning. And really what this is, is, a way of looking at project-based learning experiences that focuses on the criteria from the perspective of the learners. So when we're looking at the criteria that we pull together for project-based learning in general and also for project-based language learning, in the past it was kind of written from the point of view of what the teacher does. Now in this model, we're looking at it from the lens and the standpoint of the learners. There are six criteria in high quality project-based learning and project-based language learning. And each of those criteria has to at least be minimally present for the experience to be considered high quality PBLL. But it is also important to note that the mere presence of the criteria isn't the goal. That's really considered just the beginning. The highest quality project-based language learning experiences will deeply impact student learning and development across each of the six criteria. So let's take a look at those criteria now. The first one is intellectual challenge and accomplishment, meaning that throughout the course of the project-based language learning experience, students learn deeply, think critically, and strive for excellence. The second criteria is authenticity, meaning that the students work on projects that are meaningful and relevant to their culture, their lives, and their future. The third criteria is a public product, meaning that the student's work is real. It's publicly displayed, discussed, and critiqued, not just by the teacher. And I like to call this when I'm working with teachers in workshops and so on, I call this the work saying that the work of the students has a purpose greater than a grade and an audience beyond the teacher. The fourth criteria is collaboration in which students collaborate with other students in person or online. And they might also receive guidance from adult mentors and experts in the fields that they are exploring and studying as part of their project-based language learning experiences. The fifth criteria is project management, so that students use a project management process. They develop project management skills. This isn't a full skill set. People actually go to college to learn how to do project management. So we want to provide students the opportunity to develop that skill set so that they are able to proceed effectively from project initiation to project completion. And the last component is reflection. Students reflect on their work and their learning throughout the project. So again, these six criteria have to at least be present in order for an experience to be considered a high quality project-based language learning experience. But the goal is to have each of the six criteria be really richly and deeply embedded throughout the work that the students are engaging in. So what I'd like to do is introduce our guests 
very quickly. We have two outstanding guests with us today. And um, I hope, actually, Rachel, I hope I pronounced the second name correctly. Um, our first guest is Rachel Mamia Hernandez. She is an instructor of Portuguese, Spanish, and Latin American and Iberian studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She holds a bachelor's degree in Latin American studies and a master's in second language studies with a concentration in language teaching. She is currently pursuing her PhD in learning design and technology. Our second guest is Adam Ross, and he is a Chinese curriculum and technology specialist at the Chinese American International School in San Francisco, California. He has taught Chinese at middle and high school levels at Lakeside School in Seattle and college courses at the University of Washington. Adam has led workshops on teaching Chinese, on project-based language learning, and on technology integration in language classes. So given what we heard about high quality project-based language learning, I want to turn the floor over first to Rachel to talk to us a little bit about one project-based language learning experience that she did with her students. So yes, this is a project-based language learning project that I did with my students um, in, a in an intermediate Portuguese language class. And this was a project that actually took one whole year, so two semesters. Um, and it was revolving around the question of building literacy. So it might seem not so obvious to us, but in certain countries, like in Brazil, books are actually prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. So that means a lack of access, especially for young children in low-income communities. And so as a result, we see lower or lower literacy rates and functional literacy rates among low-income populations in a lot of regions of Brazil. So we kind of wanted a project to tackle this question of how can we help at least build child literacy in one community. So our idea was through writing children's books, getting them published and distributing them to a low income community in northeastern Brazil in the city of Salvador. And also um, in this project built in with the traditional literacy, we're just building digital literacy skills for my students as well. So they actually came up with their own children's books. We use the tool Storybird, which if you're not familiar with that um, website, it has these beautiful templates and illustrations. So from Storybird, they were able to make the books and um, we were able to publish them and they have a fundraising feature, so we're able to actually get them printed. And two of my students were able to make the trip to Brazil and visit the community and deliver them. Um, thank you, Jim, for putting up the link. So this was a year long project. And throughout the project, we sort of built up to the actual writing of the books. So first we evaluated children's books that were existing. So I brought in children's books. They looked at them. Um, actually, prior to that, one thing which I had forgotten, they talked about popular children's stories with their teletandem partners in Brazil. So they um, Skype with students from Brazil, talked about what are popular stories, what are popular characters. Then we previewed actual children's books. And we used a rubric to, oh, sure. <laughs> I'll turn on the video. So we used a rubric um, that I had created to evaluate them. And so they were evaluating them in pairs. That's what you see in one of the photos. So they would look through the books together, kind of discuss what they liked, what they didn't like, and on the rubric, evaluate each book. Um, we also, in another photo, you see how a guest speaker. Dr. Savio Siqueira from the Universidade Federal da Bahia, UFBA. And he is actually a professor of English there, but his specialty is critical 
pedagogy. So he actually brought in this critical perspective of representativeness in children's literature in Brazil, or in a sense, lack thereof. So we actually looked at this question of the lack of Afro-Brazilian and indigenous characters. After the session with Dr. Siqueira, or during the session with Dr. Siqueira, we also watched a video um, from a sort of viral video sensation, Menino Gustavo in Brazil, who is a young Afro-Brazilian boy who loves to read and also echoes this lack of Afro-Brazilian characters. So we really tried to sort of um, get the idea of writing stories that would be relevant, looking for images that would represent Afro-Brazilian characters or indigenous characters or sort of uh, have this positive self-love message. And so um, that was something my students tried to build in as they worked on their project. Um, it, we probably had several drafts. So this, like I said, was a project that kind of stretched out over two semesters instead of just being contained within one semester. Um, so there were many drafts. They worked in story, story triangles, so they would share their stories amongst each other. I would give them feedback as well. And like I said, we finally got the books published through Storybird, and they had an awesome fundraising feature. Um, so we were able to do a little social media campaign and have our friends and family and other people buy the books for the children in Brazil. So each book that was purchased went to someone in Brazil and the fundraiser also earned a small amount of um, money and that money was given as a donation to the school that we worked with in Brazil. Um, so that in a nutshell is my project. I don't wanna take up too much time. Thank you so much for sharing that. And actually, just so that everyone knows, the way the, inner, the way the program is structured, our guests will often be referring back to these projects as they answer some questions later in the program. So you might be hearing more about this project from a different lens or a different angle as we continue. Yes, for sure. Um, so let's take this next to Adam's project. So we're going to have Adam share his project-based language learning experience with you today. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Adam Ross in San Francisco. Um, I'm not sure if my video is showing, um, but I'll, I'll keep talking until we can figure that out. Um, I am uh, going to talk a little bit about the genesis of a project we have been doing for several years now at the Chinese American International School, or CASE for short. I'll, I'll just refer to it as CASE. Um, uh, Actually, the, 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 the unit was begun by our seventh and eighth grade Chinese teacher, uh, Chen Xiaoqing, uh, or Chen Laoshi, teacher Chen. Uh, she just created a unit on looking at the issue of water use in the world. And this was just purely a unit without any, any project attached to it. But it was relevant to um, our kids, and um, I, I've been neglecting to mention, our kids are students, uh, immersion students, who have been studying Chinese since they were in pre-kindergarten at Case. So they, they come into our middle school with already intermediate level uh, uh, speaking skills and uh, reading skills by and large as well. Um, in, in terms of water, being here in California, we have been in a, had been in a drought up until this past winter for several years. And uh, our kids have been learning for some time about the, the need for conserving water. And we wanted to delve into this further in Chinese. So the unit that, that Chen Laoshi developed was simply to look at, at ways of conserving water in different parts of the world, ways of recycling water, reusing water, all these things to, to, to maintain our water tables better. Um, and then finally, uh, several years ago, along with uh, Nicole and, and uh, Rachel, I joined uh, everyone at the uh, PBLL Institute at the, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and decided that, that, we, that we have a number of projects to work on, and this was one we wanted to develop into a PBLL project. So collaborating with, uh, with um, Chen Xiaoqing, we decided that we wanted to have the students develop projects where they had to go further with looking at 
uh, at all of these aspects of recycling, reusing, conserving water, giving them some choice to decide which of these aspects they're most interested in, in studying, and then producing some content within our LMS, our learning management system, which we use as PowerSchool. And uh, PowerSchool has a nice feature called a wiki, um, a wiki project, which uh, nicely uh, fills the gap left by wiki spaces that, that's, that closed as a website a couple of years ago, uh, where they develop their own videos, their own uh, um, informational uh, um, uh, uh, texts, uh, their own uh, infographics where they can present about their learning to their classmates about and, and to other students in the school about water uses. Now finally, fast forward to th this, this past year and what you're seeing in all the photos is that we just started a new uh, three-week study program in Guilin, China, and we were there in March and April. So we decided that because Guilin is a fantastically beautiful city it's 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 uh, famous for its mountains and its water that we wanted to continue the the water project into our our learning experiences there so um in, in addition to all of the work that we did already in san francisco the kids then went to to uh small classes with teachers at a program and the teachers continued the project to look at water uh um uh issues in guilin itself and then have the students engage in, in uh, projects where they did things like compared and contrast issues of, of pollution in San Francisco and Guilin, or ways that we can serve water and such. And their, their final task was to make a final presentation in groups um, at our final banquet for all of their homestay families that they had been living with for three weeks. So they had a real audience. Um, I was master of ceremonies. You can see me at the top left uh, introducing all of the kids when they came out to, to do their presentations. They did uh, all sorts of posters or they reenacted science experiments that they had done in San Francisco. So you can see the picture below me. You'll see uh, four girls uh, showing a, a basic water filtration system that they created. Um, and presented all of this to their, 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 their host families who greatly enjoyed their, the experience, learned a lot from them, uh, got to think about their own water issues in, in a different light and to think about how there are water issues all over the world and, uh, and then found a, a deeper way to connect with, with our kids. So um, I've said quite a bit right there. I can say more later, but I'll stop at this point. Thank you so much, Adam. I think we're all really intrigued by both projects and it's also just really special to hear about different types of learning situations and what our students are able to do in a variety of types of language learning programs. For this evening, our two guests are, hold on one second, there we go, uh, Laura Sexton and Megan Ferry. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction of them and then they're going to share an example of high quality project-based language learning with you. First of all, Laura Sexton teaches Spanish at Philip O'Berry Academy of Technology in Charlotte, North Carolina. She has served as a moderator of hashtag LangChat on Twitter, and she was the Foreign Language Association of North Carolina 2016 Teacher of the Year. Connecting project-based learning with proficiency-based language learning has long been a passion that fuels her blog, which you can find at pblinthetl.com. I'm sure that um, we'll find that in the chat in just a moment. Megan Ferry is a professor of Chinese and Asian studies and chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. She is currently co-president of MLA's executive committee of the Association of Departments of Foreign Languages and on the advisory board for the Open Language Resource Center at Kansas University. We are really thrilled and honored to have both of these guests here tonight. I think you're going to really be impressed with the experiences and depth of knowledge that they are each going to share with you. And to get started, we're going to ask Laura to share just one example of the work she does with her learners to facilitate high quality project-based language learning. Go ahead, Laura. So uh, one project that I'm most proud of that I might actually be updating this year is the visitor video. Um, I've done a couple of different kinds of things. I have some pictures here from when we did one for a, an Save the Animals type thing, uh, helping our animal friends. 
was the first two. We had one where we competed at a local competition with a song and students did uh, Bajo el Mismo Sol. And so you see the little world coming together. But my favorite is the visitor video that we did. And we prepared uh, some videos about some different tourist kind of places or just places to eat in our community in preparation for some exchange students coming. And that was probably my favorite thing because then the exchange students actually showed up and then we got to go do and do one of the activities with the, the students. And so the, the authentic audience was kids, other kids from Peru and they had to think what people outside of our little town when I was teaching in Gastonia would, would do. And th so this year I would be in Charlotte, it's a much bigger place and there are a lot more options. So that, that's probably gotta be my favorite project that we've done, uh, best example that we've had. Thank you so much, Laura. And we will be probably diving more in depth into that project and kind of the specifics of that project as we go through tonight's webinar, when we take a look at three specific high leverage teaching practices and how they, really do make high quality project-based language learning possible for our learners. So we'll hear more about this project as the evening continues. Megan is going to tell us a little bit about her high quality project-based language learning experience next. Go ahead. So my project was about, uh, was about, it's called Climate Change in Me, and it's using the UN, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to teach both our students uh, who are learning Chinese about their own carbon footprint and what they can do as, as part of climate action, but also to learn the fact that many minorities are, uh, are not participating in a lot of climate action and their um, issues and they're also not leading. So they were gonna be working on one about how they can themselves raise their own awareness about climate uh, change and climate action and then how they could increase minority participation in our community um, as part of the sustainability efforts so thank you can you quickly share what the public product was oh yes so uh there were uh two public products well the one that you're seeing on the on the screen here was designed for middle school students who are after school english language learners uh native chinese speakers at a middle school nearby uh so the, this group of students uh decided to work with uh, that particular uh, group of students to work with them about climate action and climate change the second group um worked with the college the chinese uh, exchange students on campus um, but the pictures you see here are the ones that they, but they all went through a very similar process. It's just their audiences were different. Thank you. I think we really look forward to hearing um, about that sort of kind of differentiation and how you can take one essential question or topic that is really engaging and impactful for your learners and go to different directions in terms of who the public audience is for it. So we're going to hear more about that, I'm sure, as we get into the webinar.